So let's have a conversation about something called Shit Hit the Fan, or SHTF. If you're in the gun community, if you're even in the prepper community, then you've heard of this term. Now, this term is thrown around a lot. It's, it's basically, it basically means that everything has gone to shit, and you have to survive in a, in a tough situation. And I think that this talking about this subject is quite valid, even though some people, even in the gun community, don't like to talk about it. They just think it's an absolutely ridiculous concept, and clearly it's not, because you have situations where that has happened. You have probably the best example I can think of is Hurricane Katrina in New Orleans, where people were literally being shot at sometimes by gangs who were trying to effectively take over, I mean, take over various swaths of territory for whatever reason. Then you have something like Hurricane Sandy, which was not quite as bad, but you definitely had some problems. Those are really two of the classic examples that I can think of. Hurricane Sandy, I actually lived through. Although I will admit right away that I didn't have to really rough it that much because my house didn't lose power. 90% of Long Island, where I live, lost power, but not my house. And some of the, some other, I think, I think the neighborhood actually, this neighborhood in particular didn't lose power. I know, you're fucking jealous at this point. I had internet, I had heat, I had everything good to go. The one thing I do remember, though, is that gas was very, very difficult to find. So we had to ration gas to a small degree. I work actually just up the street, so I was able to walk to, walk to work. Again, it didn't really affect me that much in terms of inconvenience or actual danger, but there are people who I knew who didn't have power, and the temperature was falling, and they had to resort to actually using log log burning um fireplaces they were just kind of huddled around it and it really was pretty pretty upsetting when when you think about Americans being in that situation it's even more upsetting when you see the kind of gas lines that that, that we saw i mean i can't even explain it really i i didn't live through the 1970 uh the oil crisis in the 1970s but i imagine that's sort of how it was being that the gas lines were so long and people were actually getting stabbed I remember hearing a report, I think it was maybe in, in a local area, Glen Cove, where there was a dispute over a position at the pump, and some motherfucker stabbed another one. I wasn't going to go near there. Um, thankfully, though, I was able to conserve fuel just because I just didn't use my car, because everything that I do is local. But uh, the point being is that shit at the fan does exist, and it is a real consideration. Now, what's a realistic scenario for that? Um, well, I don't think it's Mad Max, and I don't think it's um, anything to the effect of uh, the Fallout series. Uh, if you played the Fallout video game series, that's where basically the world is a nuclear wasteland, and there are mutants running around, and you got to shoot shit. And basically, it's not nothing is going to be. It's not going to be. It's not going to be as you think it is. And even when I talk about this situation, what I find to be a realistic scenario, obviously, it's not going to be a one-to-one -one thing. Things that I think is going to happen may not actually happen, and things that you think happen might actually happen. Because we don't know, because we can't predict these things, we can only theorize. We can only theorize with a certain level, with a certain margin of error. Now, let's talk about the two main ones I mentioned before, Hurricane Sandy and Hurricane Katrina. And Katrina is the one that is the most interesting. I didn't live through it, but I remember it because I was in high school at the time and it was a big deal. And it was funny because I remember when uh, Kanye West and Michael Myers, I think, were on TV, and then they were doing that live thing, and then he said, George Bush doesn't care about black people. Yeah, I actually watched that live, and it was as awkward back then as it is now to watch, especially live. But I digress. Uh, Hurricane Sandy is, like as I said, probably the more interesting of the two, because it is a probably one of the worst-case scenarios you're ever going to face. The city was virtually destroyed. People were underwater. The cops uh, were acting as, as they could, the best they could. But, but, there was gun confiscation on a large scale. And that is something that we really have to consider when shit, at the fan, when shit hits the fan. What, what are the prevailing authorities going to be doing? Now, I will say that I believe in our police force. I think that they are the... the vast majority of them are good, law-abiding people. But, as with all things as with all things run by people, they are subject to the same corruption as everybody else. So, with that in mind, let's talk about it. Now, in, in Hurricane Katrina, 
you had situations where you had gangs roving around the city, taking pot shots at uh, people who were actually trying to restore society. Uh, I think the... I don't know, I'm really sorry if you're a member of one of these organizations, but it was the Army Corps of Engineers that were trying to, if I, if I can't remember correctly, the Army Corps of Engineers was trying to prepare a bridge, and they were being raided or being shot at by gangsters or hood rats or whatever you want to call them. And that's sort of the, the, uh, one, one of the worst case scenarios where you've got people actually attacking. But I want to bring up something that these, the, the type of tactics these people are going to be using. I've heard a lot of different forums, a lot of different places where people think that it's going to be some sort of fucking firefight, like Saving Private Ryan or something out of, I guess, American Sniper, where you're going to be trading bullets and you're going to be fighting and there's going to be shit flying all over the place. No. The reason why I say that is because, first of all, you have two, typically you have two people, two armed groups of people. Now, I'm not saying that it's impossible, but it's unlikely that these two groups have any sort of military training. It's unlikely, because most Americans do not have military training. It is a fact of life. So with that said, if you don't have military training, and you're not really the best shot, and you don't really know too much about guns, and you don't really know too much about tactics, your, your primary uh, method for engaging somebody is not going to be firefight. It's going to be hit-and-run tactics. It's going to be subtle. It's going to be a... Something that they want you to be unprepared. Because these guys are not looking for a fight. They don't, they don't care about the warrior mentality. They just want to get what they want to get. And I think it's going to be the majority of shit at the fan encounters. And they're not going to be very long. And they're not going to be at particularly long range either. So to the guys who think that they're going to mount up in their chest rigs and go on fucking patrols and, you know, pacify the city, you're full of shit. It's not going to happen that way. And if you did, you're going to become a target. Not only for, not only for the for the people who might want to attack you, but also for the prevailing authority, such as police, military, and everything like that. Do you honestly think, in a situation of Hurricane Katrina, if there are people shooting at the, at you, and then you see a bunch of guys running around in camo and, and fucking chest rig, yeah, chest rig, you know, you make your man boobs big, do you think that, that they're not going to stop you and talk to you about that? Why, why would you be doing that anyway? Why would you be showing off so much? I mean, it's good to... For, it's good to let people know that you're into firearms and you believe a certain political ideology and be upfront with that. However, it's not good to provoke people in, in, in a way that's going to get you or somebody else harmed. Because you could be a normal, everyday good person. Not only are you wasting your own time by doing that, but you're also wasting the time of the, of the authorities. Because they simply don't know. They don't, they don't have psychic powers. They can't read your mind. Yet. But that's another thing you have to consider. Try to be a little bit subtle in, in, in what you're doing. Now, in terms of an actual encounter, as I said before, it's probably not going to be a firefight. And if it is, it's probably not going to last that long. And if it does last long, it'll probably mostly five minutes. Now, most Americans live in a suburban or urban setting. So the range, the idea of range is not really going to be that much of a factor. I've seen guys on forums saying that I'm going to bring my M1A and, and they ask, why do you like the M1A? Or people ask, why do you like the M1A as opposed to an AR-15 or an AK or an AK variant? And they say, it's got, it's got really big knockdown power, which is true, but it also has like a million miles range, which is good, but it's not going to help you and shit at the fan because your, your maximum engagement distance is probably going to be 100 yards. I think the longest shot ever taken in law enforcement is about 80 yards or something. And figure these guys are law enforcement. If, they're, if their maximum distance is only about 80, and they, they do this kind of stuff far off more often than we do, or average people like me and you, then I think that the, the range debate is sort of negated because you're not going to be using it to the full capacity. So why would you get something that has that kind of range when you can get something even like a high-point carbine I mean, it's 9mm, but still, are you really going to be ranging out more than 100 yards? And at that distance, is the 9mm in that particular configuration effective? And the answer is yes. Is a 223 effective at that range? The answer is hell yes. Is a 76239 effective? Hell yes, it is. So with that in mind, your, your engagement distance is going to be very, very small. Now let's talk about other things, where you have, you're walking around, you're doing your thing, you've got your gun on you for whatever reason, and then you're starting to be engaged. Some, some people are trying to shoot at you. 
What's your job at that point? Is your job to fight back? Yes, obviously. But is your job to engage? Not necessarily. Your job is primarily to break contact and get to a position where you have a bigger advantage. Now, obviously, you can't leave your family behind if they're in the house, but you're not going to stay down there on the street and you're not going to start fighting people, four, five, six, seven, eight people by yourself. So primarily in Shit at the Fan, if you engage in a fight, your job is to break contact and get the hell out of there, if possible. Um, it would help if you had friends, too. That's another thing that people don't seem to talk about that much. I've seen, I've seen, I've seen people talk about it, but not as much as, as I'd like to see. You need a support base. And what I mean by that is that you need people that you can trust. And it seems something that, um, that is a given. Maybe. But I see people all the time talking about, I'm in my shit at the fan situation, and they're using, using, the singular, using singular words as if they're implying that they're going to be doing it by themselves. The most important thing that you can have in a shit at the fan, shit at the fan situation is not guns, and it's not, it's not really anything more than just support from people that you trust. Why? Because you're not going to be able to know everything. You just don't know. I mean, can you honestly tell me that you know how to fix a car? You might know how to shoot guns really well, but do you know how to f uh, fix up wounds? Can you communicate in a different language? Can you do... I don't know. Can you fucking do origami? I, I don't know. You can't do everything. So you're going to need people who have those sort of skills. But primarily you're going to have people that you can just trust. Uh, you can just trust them to be by your side. And in a shit-hit-the-fan situation, that is probably the most important thing, having a good support base. So with that said, you have... Really, the, the, these scenarios, I think, are a very important thing to talk about. Um, with engagement distance, with considerations to politics, with considerations to everything else. But going back, way, way back, I'm sorry, none of these videos are scripted, so I just pretty much say whatever the hell I want. But let's talk about engagement range. Um, as I said, I believe the, the longest shot in law enforcement history was about 80 yards. And when society does get reestablished, and it will, although we can't predict in what form, you have to be able to justify what you've done. Now, if you go out on a raid and you're raiding enemy camps, like, like fucking something from World of Warcraft, then you're going to have to explain to somebody why you were doing that. And if you actually engage or you're the aggressor in that, in that situation, it's going to be rather awkward for you because you have to prove that by being aggressive that you somehow are, have preemptively stopped something and that's not going to fly in court. It's not going to happen. So you have to make sure that you're always defensively minded. Not offensively minded. Defensively minded. How are you going to explain how you took a thousand yard shot and you iced a guy? How are you going to explain that? Especially when the guy has a fucking pistol. Or the guy may have... I don't know what kind of gun he has. It can be spun so many ways. You can have a fucking Remington 700. And you engaged him in a thousand yards and killed him. You, how, you, how are you going to be able to explain that in a court of law? Obviously, at that point, you weren't necessarily acting defensively because you took that extra step to engage your target. Now, for a lot of people, that's going to be viewed as murder because the guy was not attacking you at the time. It doesn't matter whether or not you saw him in your neighborhood, you saw him do this and you saw him do that. It doesn't even matter if you saw him kill people. Unless you've got witnesses, and a lot of witnesses that are going to testify on your behalf, you're you're not going to have you're not going to have that kind of um, you're not going to have that kind of clout unless you have actual documentation of the guy actually at, or whoever attacking you. Then um, you're not going to it's not going to fly in court. It's simply not going to happen because it's your word against the dead body. <laughs> um, even even with witnesses, it can be it can turn around. Any hard evidence that you have is recommended. So I guess I would say that document what you do. Make sure that you have documentation about everything that you do. If you have a sort of cell phone camera, uh, then document what's going on. If you, if you can see a crime in progress, again, how are you going to do this when you're being attacked? I don't know. But if there's a way to document it, then by all means, try to do that. Because society is going to come back. And you have to figure out a way to protect yourself legally as well as physically. Physically is only really half the battle. Legally is another half of the battle. Once the original battle is complete, you have the sort of after action, which is going to happen. So again, just be aware of that. Be aware that you're going to have to explain every single one of your actions and have a, good, have a clear conscience. 
Don't do something because you feel like you're fucking Batman or the Punisher or some shit. You're not Batman or the Punisher. You're not. You're not a badass either. Stay out of conflict. Try to keep yourself safe. And do whatever it, can, whatever it takes to keep yourself safe. And if you have to defend somebody, defend your life, then do so. But don't do so with the idea of trying to kill somebody. Do so with the idea of stopping the threat. That is one of, one of the main things I think most schools will teach you. Or, in fact, tactical firearm schools. They'll tell you, do not try to kill Try to stop. If you kill them in the process, then so be it. But you do not want to kill people. You're not like that. You're not a bad person. And it doesn't matter what the other person is trying to do to you. As long as you can stop the threat, then perhaps that's for the best. Now, you, now it gets a little bit complicated when you, and, you know, police are unavailable and everything like that. But, again, I can't explain, I can't explain every single scenario. But um, in that situation, just be aware you're not a killer. You're not a bad person. And don't go down to that level. Your job is to defend your life, not take somebody else's. And I think in the should defend situation, that is um, really paramount to, to realize that in the end, you have to be able to look yourself in the mirror. You have to be able to look other people in the face. Now, this is just one part of the two-part series I want to talk about. So, yeah, part two coming up soon, guys. Thanks for listening.